I think there's nothing more existential than AI, especially for a fashion company. I was in Milan uh, not too long ago. I had a uh, company that was making shoes, and what they showed me was they uh, took the shoes from 20, 20, 21, 22, and 23, dumped them in an LLM, and then asked it to predict what the shoes were going to look like in 24. Within 15 minutes, it had put out 50 shoes. Went back to the LLM and said, uh, add red and greens and bigger heels, bigger insoles. Within another 15 minutes, they had selected 25 of these that they dumped in the metaverse to test, and they went right to uh, pr production on them. So this person has 30 designers working for them and was telling me how much it cut down not only time, but also the expense. So these are things that you guys need to be thinking about. So I want to open up in, in the first instance and say, what are the use cases you guys are seeing fashion companies, retail and beauty companies using these tools for? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, so design, as you said, is definitely one of the biggest use cases that we're seeing. Um, you may have seen that uh, Nike announced publicly that they are developing their own proprietary LLM, large language model, which is sort of the brain for these AI tools. And they're dumping all of their proprietary data into an LLM in order to uh, tailor designs based on uh, pr uh, previous product and uh, athlete performance data. So if you know that a particular product uh, resulted in you know better performance uh, for a runner, they're using that information to uh, refine and modify designs of their sneakers. Uh, we've seen it from uh, other companies as well where they're designing entire capsule collections uh, using generative AI. So they might go to a, a generative AI tool, enter a prompt that says, you know, this is a theme we want for our upcoming seasonal capsule collection. Uh, give us dozens or even hundreds of designs. And then that doesn't replace the humans, right? But it does allow the human designers to winnow down the options or maybe refine the concepts and just gives them a much broader template to work from at the outset. Um, so those are a couple examples of what we've seen uh, recently. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So as Tony and Dan have both mentioned, um, some of the clear benefits of using Gen AI in design is cost and time e efficiency. So a project that would usually take a team of 20 designers to do in six months, Gen AI can do in a matter of minutes. And on top of that, uh, based on the Nike example that Dan just gave, you can see that Gen AI can also be used to kind of drive customer engagement um, towards the product. Yeah, and, and I would just emphasize, it's a huge marketing opportunity for these companies. Nike, for example, rolled out some of their uh, AI uses at the Olympics, um, and they worked with some of their sponsored athletes and told them that they could design their own custom sneakers, Nike sneakers, using an LLM prompt. So, um, you know, if you want some piece, of, some sneaker that's particularly, uh, you know, well-suited for track and field or something like that, they were letting their, uh, their sponsored athletes test that out, design their own sneakers, and potentially even make those sneakers. And that was something that they got a lot of publicity on. Um, and then, you know, of course, um, the opportunities for uh, supply chain management, for inventory Before management. Before you move there, yeah. real quick, you, you saw the news yesterday with Puma, what they had actually admitted. Because Puma is about 70% wholesale. And they were talking about the tool, they had a whole article on this and how it really helped engagement. And you were talking about consumer engagement and the like. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one area where we see this a lot is in the gaming space, right? So um, there have been uh, you know partnerships with Electronic Arts, the video game uh, developer, where consumers are able to design their own custom, say, Puma sneakers, and then uh, let their avatars in the game wear those sneakers. So you have you have the sponsorship, the collaboration between the video game developer and the the brand. Um, and you have the engagement piece where the consumer is able to design that concept, wear it, and, and also potentially purchase it. And Puma, Puma was saying that they increased their sales in India by 10% by figuring out if somebody was coming in from India and then serving the back of the ad with an Indian theme. 
So AI is able to determine that very quickly. Right. And, you know, the, the data piece is, I think, really critical for a lot of uh, fashion and retail companies that we work with. AI, you know, one of the best things that it offers is the ability to really leverage data, to organize data, to be able to derive um, insights out of a big database of information in a way that is has not previously really been practical. So, you know, if you have all of this uh, consumer data about, you know, what sells best in a particular season, what colors are most popular, you can do a lot of predictive analytics to, you know, know this is what we need to have, um, you know, get ahead of for the next season. This is the color that's going to be hot. This is, you know, whatever it's, whatever it is, these LLMs give you a great new resource to be able to uh, predict and then integrate some of those uh, uh, practices into your supply chain and inventory management. Yeah. Absolutely, and on, on top of that, AI can be used to predict uh, new trends that are coming up, and uh, with that, again, to drive inventory management, you can direct certain inventory SKUs to areas where you know a product might be popular, as well as sizes and just you know overall efficiency in that end. Yeah, and I would um, just you know one other use case that we're seeing a lot of is obviously in the. Uh, marketing and customer relations piece. So um, chatbots are very popular, of course, with uh, any e-commerce platform. Um, AI-powered chatbots offer a lot more capabilities than you know what might be sort of the traditional chatbot. Um, but they also come with their own sort of unique set of risks that really need to be um, closely watched and, and managed. Um, but those are a great opportunity. And uh, another good you know, example, I think, is what Amazon has done with uh, customer reviews. So if you look at Amazon now, they are summarizing all of their customer reviews using generative AI. So if you go on their website, you don't have to scroll through all the five-star reviews now. You can just see at the top level the, you know, people like this product because X, people don't like it because of Y. And these are all just, you know, that may sound like a small use case, but these are ways to really create a lot of efficiencies in an organization. So let's move to the legal side. So you guys have given us some use cases. What do you see as the biggest risks? So uh, certainly the IP risks are at the forefront for a lot of our clients. Um, copyright issues are a really big area of concern, I would say. Uh, and there are two elements to that. One is if you are using generative AI to create new content, you don't necessarily have copyright protection in that AI-generated content. So say you go to an LLM, uh, or you know, chat GPT, and you say, produce a slick new marketing video that features our products. Um, you don't necessarily have copyright protection in that video, which means it's in the public domain, which means anybody else could potentially use it. You might have other ways to enforce your rights. If it has your trademarks in it, you could still have a trademark infringement claim, but you don't necessarily have the copyright piece. And that's one of the things I always wonder. I mean, how much do most of our clients care about having a copyright in their product? So you have shoes and the like. Do you, I, I see very few people sue on copyright for shoes when the economic benefit to using this for creation of a shoe far outweighs the risk. But to your point, ads and other things like that, absolutely. Yeah, and it, it definitely does vary by use case. Um, the other piece that's important to think about on the IP front is infringement. Um, so protection is sort of do you have rights in the content that you are producing using generative AI? Infringement is is the output that is produced uh, infringing of a third party's intellectual property. We have seen clear instances of infringement from AI generated content that clients have sent us. So, and some of it is things like publicity rights. So maybe a well-known actor, <laughs> actress is, her face is in you know one of the images that a client wants to use for marketing or for apparel or something like that. Uh, you have to be very careful and not assume that anything that is produced using Gen AI is non-infringing. Yeah, and, and if, if you're looking into exploring AI for your business, something to be mindful of when you are trying a publicly available free version of an AI tool such as ChatGPT is to pay attention to the terms of use. So in a lot of these instances for the free services, there are use restrictions prohibiting you from using any output for commercial reasons, as well as um, other things to be mindful of are indemnification, what the platform is going to indemnify you for if in the event that some of the output does, imprint, does infringe on third-party IP. And one of the things you did look at 
uh, you comb through all the available tools and sort of categorize them on which tools have different restrictions, right? Yeah, exactly. And other things to be mindful of in these platforms is what the platform can do with the output and the prompt that you feed it. So oftentimes the platforms will license themselves back any output that is generated that you own, but the company has, the platform has the right to use it as well. So if your designer is using MidJourney or other things like that for creation of content, you got to figure out what license you're giving to MidJourney that they're giving to your competitors. Right, and we do see significant uh, variation among terms of use and among even in the enterprise agreements that uh, these developers or deployers of AI tools are offering. Um, Microsoft and Adobe both publicly acknowledged or publicly announced that they were going to be offering uh, indemnity against third-party IP infringement claims. Um, so those are two. That's a major protection if you're using Adobe tools or Microsoft tools. But you also have to be careful about how that appears in an enterprise agreement. They, they've announced that they're offering the, the IP indemnity, but you want to look closely at what the details of that indemnity are. Um, and there are other companies that are not offering indemnity at all, which makes just a really big difference in terms of uh, what your risk level might be. So let's, let's move to in-house use. We have a lot of in-house people here. What, what risk do they have to worry about bringing the tool in-house? Yeah, I think, you know, the bottom line for any of these tools is that you need to think about it as uh, any other third party software that you would be onboarding into your organization. So uh, most, you know, most of our clients have a IT department or they have a tech, a head of tech, and that person is going to evaluate all the software that is downloaded and used on the system. And that's a really important piece that you want to make sure you are applying to the use of generative AI tools. Uh, you don't necessarily just want to assume that an AI tool is fit for use, that it's that it's safe, that it's effective. Um, and, you know, there's some really important things that you want to look at, um, as we mentioned before, the indemnity piece. But, you, you know, AI tools are unique in that many of them are built on third party or even fourth party tools, right? So you have most of the AI developers that you might bring in for, say, a chatbot are actually going to be using you know, GPT as the underlying LLM. So you want to know not just what your data sharing agreement is with your vendor, but how is your vendor sharing data back with OpenAI? And those are really important links to look at and to make sure that you are applying your organization's data privacy security standards to that agreement. Yeah, and, and on top of that, so if you are thinking of implementing AI in your business, it's important to have an AI use policy internally for how you do use these AI tools. So for example, a couple years ago, Samsung, uh, there was a Samsung employee who inputted all of a board meeting notes into ChatGPT, the pub publicly available version of it. And it ended up inadvertently disclosing all of the confidential information, proprietary uh, information from that meeting. So again, that's something to be mindful of, of how your employees are using AI. And, you know, in certain instances, you may want to restrict that use. Yeah. And a lot of these challenges sound very daunting or they're, they're sort of scary with Gen AI, but I would say they're also quite solvable through enterprise agreements. So most of the big developers are offering good data security protections. They're offering uh, opportunities for encryption, for storing an LLM or the general uh, generative AI tool locally or in a secure cloud environment where only your company has access to the data. And so those are just things you want to look for in a contract uh, or in a services agreement and make sure that you're hitting those key points for the most part, if you're doing that, you're going to have you know a pretty reasonable level of protection, especially if you're also getting indemnities, reps and warranties, et cetera. So continue on that. I, we, we've seen we haven't really talked about the data issue much and the like. Uh, I know that a lot of our clients, some in the room here, have been sued for class action for using a chat box. I mean, these chat boxes are amazing because somebody comes in and speaks Chinese, it will convert, answer the questions in direct. And the argument that these plaintiff attorneys are, are arguing is it's a wiretap. So we've seen that. Any other like issues you're seeing out there that uh, are, are sort of novel that you haven't seen before? So one uh, issue that it's come up is using AI in term, for employment purposes, uh, reviewing resumes. I think there's been a couple of complaints filed for discriminatory used by the AI racial profiling racial profiling. Yep. Yeah. We're also seeing a very active um, 
legal and regulatory uh, environment at the state level. So uh, just in the last month and mostly just yesterday, uh, California enacted 18 new uh, AI bills. And some of those you know, deal with things like disclosure. So if you are communicating with a consumer using a generative AI tool, you're obligated to disclose. Uh, the EU AI Act has a similar uh, requirement. There's a state law in Utah. There's a state law in Colorado. Uh, all of these things are you know, really just, we're just at the beginning stage of these types of legal and regulatory uh, developments. But disclosure is a really big one if you're working in a consumer, um, if you're working in an e-commerce platform or directly with consumers. We've also seen some regulation on the telemarketing front. So if you're doing any uh, calling directly to consumers, if you're using a synthetic voice, an AI-generated voice in those uh, calls, you're potentially triggering uh, uh, penalties under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, which can be very significant. So a lot of consumer protection issues. Yeah, and just to touch base on the EU AI Act, so. A lot, we know a lot of our clients here do business in, in the EU, and even though you don't have a physical presence there, there are certain things that may trigger uh, compliance, required compliance for US companies under the EU AI Act. So Felicia, I also know that you've helped some clients, and I think you have too, Dan, on the issue of virtual influencers and, and the like, or even, uh, can you talk a little bit about that, what you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the benefits of using a virtual AI influencer is that they are not a human. So there are certain regulations that uh, you don't need to be concerned about, such as SAG-AFTRA um, and any child labor laws. If you're using, for example, a child AI model, that will save a company a lot of costs in terms of complying with these regulations. Yeah, just pausing on that, I mean, one of the biggest issues we have is bringing in child models. We need to get parental consent. We need uh, sometimes verification, notification, depending from a court system, if it's really important and the like. Uh, going to AI and using children models, fake models in your background is a tremendous savings uh, from the contractual standpoint as well as we get into SAG and the like. So Yeah, I would just add, though, that there are uh, – SAG is certainly trying to extend its authority over – um, the use of what they call digital likenesses uh, who resemble a real person either in whole or in part. If there is it, actually the language of the SAG-AFTRA agreement from last year after they went on strike uh, says that if there's any element of a digital likeness that resembles or that is recognizable as a real person, then potentially that is covered by a SAG-AFTRA uh, um, labor negotiation. So, you know, if it's Taylor Swift's eyes, if, if for some reason consumers could recognize just that, you might owe, if she was SAG, you might owe some sort of uh, royalty to her. Um, and there are other, you know, there are other elements in the, the virtual avatar space where you have to be really careful. Uh, one of the new California bills uh, from just this past week touches on digital replicas, digital likenesses, and says that if you are going to be using a digital likeness that resembles a real person, you have to have sort of a heightened level of consent. You've got to have ex express informed consent in the agreement with that performer. Uh, otherwise, the agreement is unenforceable. So potentially, you hire this actor, you use a digital replica of them to film an extra scene or to redo a commercial. Unless you have expressly uh, spelled that out in the terms of the agreement, they can get out of it and they can allege that you know you've gone outside of the contract. So it's an area that's that's really tricky. And then you know the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is also very closely monitoring the use of virtual avatars. Uh, they have said that virtual avatars are still subject to the FTC's disclosure requirements. So I'm sure you're all familiar. You've got a you know sponsored ad, um, you know ambassador, whatever. Those requirements apply even if those uh, influencers are AI generated. So you can't just assume that you are outside of the regulatory space there. Okay. Guys, I want to thank you very much. We'll keep on track. Thank you. Michelle.